Can I retire at 55 with $1.1 million saved for retirement? That's what we're going to look at today on the Your Financial EKG YouTube channel. We're going to go through each individual section of a Your Financial EKG, of a detailed financial plan. So you can see, can I retire at 55 with $1.1 million saved for retirement? I want you to take this information put it to your own retirement plan and ask yourself the same question. Can I retire at such and such age with such and such save for retirement? Or are there things that I need to think about, I need to add to, I need to subtract from in my retirement planning? All right, you ready? Let's get to it. Now, here's what we've got. We got Wilson and Nancy Martin. They're both 55 years old and they're gonna retire here in a few months. And they contacted me, they're from the great state of California. And they asked, hey, we're 55, we've saved $1.1 million, can we retire? Now their current salaries, 99,000, right at $100,000 for Wilson and Nancy makes right about $200,000. So they've got about $300,000 in working income right now. So if we go through the plan and it doesn't work or some adjustments need to be made, we still have $300,000 in income that we're working for that we can continue to add to our retirement accounts, add to our wealth if we need to do that. Now, from a social security standpoint, Nancy wants to take social security at 67. At 67, her social security would be $3,519. Now, Wilson wants to take social security at 62, which would be 2,074. Now, keep in mind, if you take social security early, if you take social security at 62, you're only gonna get 70% of your full retirement benefit. If you wait to 67, you're gonna get 100% of your full retirement benefit. And if you wait till 70, if you're an overachiever, a broccoli eater, you would get 124% of your full retirement benefit. Now, the reason that Wilson wants to wait till 62 or actually wants to take Social Security early is because of his health his health has been very poor over the last few years. And so in his mind, he's thinking, I wanna get my money as soon as possible. But that might not be the best decision depending on their financial plan. We need to go through this and look at that in each individual situation. Now, for him, it might be a good idea with his health, but we also wanna to try to maximize Nancy's Social Security in the event that we lose Wilson. As you can see, Wilson's Social Security is 2,074. That's 70% of his full retirement benefit. If we add an extra 30% in there, that's only gonna take his Social Security to $2,700. So even at 67, Wilson's Social Security is still gonna be less than Nancy's. So it, it might not make sense to try to maximize his it actually would make more sense to maximize Nancy's, try to push her social security to 70. Because if she waited till 70, so she's getting $3,519, $3,519 at 67. If we wait till 70, that's an extra 24% or added on. So that would be $4,363 is what she would get at 70 with COLA adjustments if she waited. And so if Wilson's health is poor, maybe we need to try to maximize Nancy's under the assumption that Wilson might not be with us for the entirety of their retirement, okay? Now, obviously we don't know what the next day brings, but we want to do our due diligence and our planning. Now, from a pension standpoint, Nancy gets a pension at 65, so about 10 years from now, of $1,322, and that does have a 3% COLA increase, as well as 100% survivor benefit, meaning if Nancy passes away, Wilson would get her pension, right? He would get 100% of 1,322 adjusted 
for inflation. Wilson has a pension at 65. It's $500 a month. It has no COLA increase and no survivor's benefits. So there's no increase to that $500 and there's not gonna be any survivor's benefits when he passes away. Again, it's really important that we maximize their social securities in this situation and we make sure they're not gonna run out of retirement income because of Wilson's poor health. All right, so let's look at assets. Now from an asset standpoint, Wilson in his current 401k has $208,000 saved in his 401k. In a joint account at their bank, they've got about $250,000 in cash. And so when we're gonna go through their retirement plan and their retirement investing, we might talk about repurposing some of that cash to get them a better rate of return. Now keep in mind, high yield savings accounts right now, CDs, you might be able to get three and 4%, but do we need to have that amount of cash in the bank? One of the questions I always ask people when I see that is, why is there such an, a, a large amount of cash sitting in your bank? And they might say, well, I just feel comfortable with that amount in savings, or we sold a property and we just didn't know what to do with it, or we're just scared to invest it, we don't know what to do. And so as a financial advisor, when we're doing the EKGs, when we're doing the financial plan, my job is to say, hey, I understand that you're concerned about where the market is. I understand you don't wanna lose this money. That's why you have it in the bank. You want it safe and secure. Can we invest that? Maybe we invest it really conservative, get you a very low rate of return, but do something better than you're doing in the bank. And let me show you how that's gonna impact your retirement plan, how that's gonna be better than just leaving it in the bank. Now, Wilson does have an old 401k with $193,000 in it, and Nancy has a 403b with $480,000 in it. Now, they're both contributing to their 401k and their 403b. Obviously, they're gonna retire here soon, so those contributions are gonna go away, but until then, they're contributing $3,000 and $2,500, respectively, into their assets. Now, they have a home, that would be a protected asset. It's worth about $1.9 million and it, it's, it's paid off. Now they live in San Francisco and so a lot of their equity, a lot of their savings has gone to their house and that's why you see such an, a large asset there compared to retirement savings because they live in an area where home values are priced so high. So we look at this and we say, okay, this is a benefit to you. You've got a house that's worth $1.9 million. And as we go through this plan, you're gonna see what I'm talking about with this. Do we wanna keep this house or can we use some of this cash for your plan? Or do you wanna stay here for the rest of your life? So that's, that's, an, that's an option and it's actually a really good benefit for them. Now you can do the same thing. Maybe you have a house that's paid off and it's worth $300,000 or $500,000 or even $800,000, whatever it might be, wherever a part of the country you are, Think about the ways that the questions that you want to ask yourself are one, am I going to stay here for the rest of my retirement? Could I downsize and use some of this equity to as, as an influx of capital into my retirement plan, into my retirement income to help elongate my retirement assets? I've got a client who sold his house and moved into an apartment so he could use the assets for retirement income. And that, that was his plan. Your plan's going to be different. So we want to look through that. We want to work through each individual scenario. Now, they've got about $1.1 million right now, of which 22% is in the bank, that's the $250,000. 77 or 78%, which is 882, is invested. So if we look at their net worth, we've got spendable assets of $1.1 million. We have protected assets of $1.9 million. So we've got a total net worth of $3,032,000. Now, before you turn it on and say, oh, they got $3 million, they're gonna be fine. Keep in mind, they're in California. They're in a high cost state. So you might be watching this in Idaho, you might be watching this in Montana or Kentucky or Tennessee and thinking, well, I don't, I don't, I don't need that much. I mean, if I had $3 million, I'd live like a king. You want to kind of look at this in the perspective of where you're at in the country. So for them, $3 million, living in San Francisco is not like living like a king, right? So we still need to put the same due diligence into their retirement plan as we would if they had a million dollars in Knoxville, Tennessee, all right? Now, portfolio weighted average, we're gonna look at 
6% as our rate of return for the money that's in the market. So the money that's staying invested, the 401k, the 403b, which will eventually roll out into IRAs, those are gonna earn 6% on a projected level. Now, keep in mind, we have to look at market norms or historical returns. So we're gonna take this plan and we're gonna say, what would it have done if it was the year 2000? What would this financial plan do if it was the year 1968 or 1975? or whenever, because we wanna see what this plan would do if the market and history, maybe doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme a little bit, right? It kinda of looks like it did when this happened. So we go, okay, this is what your portfolio would look like. Because keep in mind, over the next 30 years, you're gonna face at least five recessions. So if you retire today or you retire 10 years from now, you're gonna face at least five recessions and out of those five recessions you're going to face at least two to three stock market crashes that means 20 30 40 percent loss in your retirement investing accounts and so you've got to look at your retirement plan and you need to factor those in it can't be all rainbows and unicorns and fairy dust and say okay i'm going to earn four five six percent for the rest of my life no it's gonna be a roller coaster, especially if you stay invested in the stock market. And I'm not against the stock market because you've gotta earn a rate of return to take out retirement income to last throughout the rest of your life. Interest rates aren't high enough for you to put all the money in the bank and just earn interest from a CD or from a federal credit union or whatever. And so when we're investing in the market, we've got to have a projected return, which we're going to put a 6%, but we also have to look back at what the market has done and take a realistic approach to that and say, okay, if we have a year 2000 to 2003, like a sequence of return risk situation, what am I going to do? How am I going to invest? And emotionally, how am I going to react, right? Quantitative, what are we going to do? Qualitative, how are we going to react? All right. The house, we're gonna give a 1% increase on that for as long as we stay in there. So when we look at this portfolio as a whole, we've got a 4.68 portfolio weighted average because $250,000 sitting in the bank earning nothing. So we're gonna probably wanna increase that and, and I'll show you what we're gonna do here once we get into some recommendations. Now, from an expense standpoint, their expenses are $5,000 a month, which is pretty low for where they live. The reason for that is they're very frugal. They don't do a whole lot of extra stuff. The house has been paid off. So 5,000 is kind of the base. The kids are gone. We're taking property taxes out of other cash flows and things like that. So this is just kind of bare bones expenses. I'm gonna show you some of the things that they wanna do coming up next. Now from an inflation standpoint, we are gonna stay at 3.24%. So these expenses are gonna get an inflation rate of 3.24% forever okay now cash flows this is the big cash flow for them they want to do overseas travel they have family that lives in another country and they want to spend six months over there and they want to spend six months here so they want to go over there when the weather's nice and then come back to california when the weather's nice here isn't that isn't that the perfect scenario that we want to do so they want to do overseas travel and they want to start that pretty much right away and we're going to take twenty thousand dollars a year with inflation so i'll show you this look we're gonna take an annual distribution of $20,000. We're gonna give a 3% inflation rate, and we're gonna do that for the next 20 years. So from 55 to 65 and 65 to 75. And the reason you wanna put inflation on your travel, okay, is because $20,000 today might get you to Paris, France, but $20,000 20 years from now might just get you to Paris, Texas. And so we wanna put inflation on our travel to know, is this going to be sustainable? Are these withdrawals, not just our retirement income, like what we need to live and breathe, but is our travel, is our goals and dreams sustainable within the current environment? And I'm not putting eight and 9% inflation, I'm just using 3.24% because that's the 108 year average. It's probably gonna be higher over the next decade, but if you look at over a 30 and 40 year scale, it'll probably come back down to the mean, which is about 3.24%. About now, taxes are a big deal. Keep in mind, they're in California. So your state tax is high. Your federal tax is probably gonna be a little higher because of 
national debts and we've got to pay for social security and we've got medicare to fund and we've got all these different social programs and again i'm not against them i'm just saying we've got to fund a lot of stuff as a government so where the taxes are at today it's probably not going to be like that for the next 10 15 20 years so they're already in a high tax state which you've got to start thinking about do i want to stay in this state and pay these state taxes or do i want to move to a lower cost state and what is the federal tax is gonna look like over time, right? So we wanna always look at that. So if we look at, let's say like 2030, you know, their projected federal rate is still really low. Keep in mind, I'm projecting out taxes to 2030. The Trump tax code expires in 2025. So the legislation at that time is gonna to have to put together a new tax code or it reverts back to the Obama era tax code, which again, is not terrible. But software can't project political risk. You know, within the market, you have market risk. You've got national risk like uh, foreign crises and wars. And you have political risk. Like, I don't know what legislators are thinking. Who does? And so I can't always, I can project to 2025 because I know where the taxes are going to be at least till then. But I don't know after that. So we have to make our best guess, which again, We've got a national debt that's high. We have Social Security and Medicare that needs to be funded. We have some other programs that need to be funded. So taxes are probably going to have to go up. So for them, you know, our state tax is going to already be at the top. But we also want to look at trying to bring this down because their income right now is falling between $22,000 and $89,900. Their gross income is at one hundred six. But this is showing a deduction of $27,000 married filing jointly. That's the deduction, the standard deduction right now. It's probably not going to be there. If you think about when Obama, the Obama era taxes were, which which were right before Trump's tax change, the standard deduction was at twelve. Okay, so take off, take that twenty seven thousand down to twelve. Let's just do the math real quick. Let me show you this. One oh six, oh sixty eight. That's our, that would be our gross income. Let's take a twelve five standard deduction. So instead of seventy eight thousand three sixty eight. We're actually at 93,568. Okay. So now you're looking at 93,000. That's putting us over the 12% into the 22% bracket based on the Trump era tax return or the Trump era tax code. So you've really, really got to be diligent, diligent, diligent about your tax planning. Okay. So pre retirement. Really, we've just got a few months left before we're going to have about $1.1 million saved for retirement. So let's go to retirement. And so we look at this and we can already see a shortfall. At 90 years old, they're going to run out of money. It's going to be at zero. The amount needed today to avoid a shortfall, they need an influx of about $118,000 into their plan today to never run out of money. Now, I don't like to get down to the penny with running out at 100 because there's things like long-term care, assisted living, you know, um, here in Florida, we have hurricanes and natural disasters. You, you want to have some, you know, some flux there. But for them, remember, we've got a $1.9 million home. If we sell that and move to a lower cost area of California, can we influx $500,000 into this plan? And that's going to take care of it. It's a question. It's a personal question. You have to be asking yourself, your spouse, your partner, your significant other, whoever, what are we going to do when we retire? What are we going to do with this house? You know, I live in a house that's got three bedrooms because we have multiple kids. Well, do we need all that when we get to retirement? If the kids are gone, maybe, maybe not. It does, you, you never know. So you got to start thinking about those questions. Now, the rate of return needed to avoid a shortfall, this is where we're going to hang out for a minute, is 6.24%. Now, what that means is this portfolio needs to earn six and a quarter percent for them to never run out of money. So that means we need either a 6.25% rate of return on the money that's already invested. So not the bank account, but the 401ks, the 403bs, or we need to take some money out of the bank and we need to get that invested and we need to bring up that rate of return. So that's where I want to start first, because you can see here's the travel coming out. Here's our Social Security for Wilson kicking on because he wants to start Social Security early. Then we've got Social Security for both of them kicking on here. All right, because Nancy's Social Security kicks in. Wilson's already on Social Security. And then we still have the travel for 20 years. And then we stop it at 76. 
and then basically we're out of money at 90. Again, not a bad plan, right? Mortality is at 84 and 86, male and female. 90 is pretty good, but can it be better? Do, do we want it to be better? Sure we do. We want to have some flux, some gap, but look at this too. Look at their house. At 90, they got a $2.7 million house, just earning 1%. So again, there's a lot of things that could be done at this point. We could talk about reverse mortgages. We could talk about selling the house, especially if they're going to move into maybe say an independent care facility. I've got a lot of clients now that move into these independent care facilities where you go in as, a, as independent, like you're doing what you want to do. It's like an apartment. You're doing what you want to do, but as your health De you know, declines, you go from independent to assisted to long-term care to then, you know, passing away. And so they've got the option for that. But what if they don't want to do that? What if they want to leave that house as an inheritance to the children? Because right now, from a tax standpoint, if you leave your house to your kids, the cost basis on your death goes to them and they're able to sell that house. So what if they want to do that? Well, we need to readjust and look at some other options. All right, let's look at the assets because that's where we've got about $250,000 sitting in the bank earning zero. So we need at least six and a quarter to not run out of money. So what if we repurpose some of that cash? So let's look at that. So now we have $100,000 in the bank and we're going to repurpose $150,000 into a taxable brokerage account. But remember, the money that's in the bank, they want to keep conservative. So the money that we put in the taxable brokerage account needs to be conservative as well because that's how they feel. Like, I don't want to push risk onto anybody. That's not my job. My job is to help people invest based on their risk tolerances and to give them recommendation. I might say, hey, you need to be a little bit more aggressive you're 35 and you're investing like you're 60. But if you're 55 and going into retirement, every little penny counts. And so your risk capacity, meaning the, the ability for the portfolio to give you income and not deplete itself and your risk tolerance, meaning how you feel about risk, they really need a, to mesh, okay? So we're gonna put $150,000 into the taxable brokerage account. We're also gonna give it a rate of return of 4%. Now the reason we're using 4% because that's really conservative. Remember, I use 6% as a rate of return because that is 2% behind the market's historical average. The market has historically averaged 8%. That means you're correlated to the S&P 500, okay? So if you are younger, if you're watching this and you're in your 30s and 40s, you wanna try to be correlated as closely as possible to the S&P 500, getting eight, nine, 10%, whatever the s and is getting for that year, could be negative eight, nine, 10%, right? Once you step into retirement, once you start to shift, because there's this shift where you go from accumulation to preservation and distribution. In their case, they're shifting their assets from growth and accumulation to now we're living off this money. It's about preservation and distribution, income. And so we're gonna bring the projected rate of return down to 6% and the money in the bank we're gonna put at 4%. And the reason we're doing that is because it's not about the money you make in retirement, but it's about the money you keep in retirement. And that is the most important thing, all right? So now let's go over to retirement. Remember, we needed six and a quarter and they were out at 90. So if we add in $150,000, now we're out at 91, okay? What's our rate of return gonna be here? 6.36, so we still need a really good rate of return. We've got an extra year of income, okay? So we've got ourselves an extra year of income, but we still haven't got this money to 100. So what's something we can do? Obviously, we talked about reverse mortgages already. We talked about selling the house. Well, I can't project a reverse mortgage in this software, so let's sell the house. So let's go to 80. So at 80 years old, they'd have a home worth $2.4 million and about $312,000 in spendable assets. So what we need to do is we need to sell this house we need to move into something else. We need to take the equity from this house and repurpose it into the plant. Now, I don't know what the real estate market's gonna look like in 2048, okay? I cannot tell you, but what we can do is we can do an assumption. So let's take a million five and buy a house with it. So where's 2.4 million, two, four, six, three. 
let's subtract out a million and a half dollars because we're talking about California. So that leaves us $963,000. So let's take $900,000 as a round number in the year 2048. So we go to cash flows. We go to, let's add in, sell the house. We're gonna do an annual one, so a one time of $900,000. We're gonna sell it in June of 2048, okay? It's gonna come from a taxable external source and it's gonna go into our cash flow account, which is just a basically a taxable brokerage account. So we're gonna save that. Let's go back to our retirement picture. And now look at this, at 100, We've got $442,000 and our projected rate of return is adequate. So let me show you what we did there. At 80, we influx that $900,000. We sold the house, so it's not really worth $2.4 million now, it's worth $1.5 million. And what I would normally do within the financial EKG is I would create a new scenario. I'd copy this information, but I would create a new scenario that says sold home. We'd put the new value of the home in there and we'd influx the cash. But because this is a YouTube video, I wanna make it simple for you to watch. So the house is really worth one and a half at this point. We've influxed 900,000 and boom, there we go. So then now let's go back to cash flows and let's see if we decide not, let's not, let's not do 900,000 because that might be, you know, let's just say we influx 500,000. Remember it's 2.4 is what the house is worth. We still gotta buy a house in California. It's, it's a, high, a high real estate market right there in San Francisco. So let's just do 500,000. We net 500,000 from selling and buying, selling, moving, all that. What does that do for us? Still, we run out at 100 with $29,000. So we, even then we can still sell our house for, we can buy a house for more, right? Have less equity to influx into the portfolio and we're still doing okay. Now, let's go back to, let's take out selling the house because we need to take that out of the plan, all right? And let's go to market. Let's look at what this would do based on some market projections. So here's our projection over here, okay? Earning the 5.2 and the 6% rate of return. And then this is the market comparison. And so what I wanna do is look at some historical averages. I wanna say what would happen if we had the year 2000? So in the year 2000, we had a unique situation where in 2000, 2001, and 2002, the market went down for three straight years. That's called sequence of return risk. Sequence of return risk is the biggest risk to your retirement. And that risk is this. You step into retirement and immediately, or in the short term, the market falls 10, 20, or 30%. And you're using your retirement investments for income. And so you're taking money out of an investment that's going down. And then the next year, the market does the same thing. And you're taking income out of your investments and the market's going down and you haven't got the social security yet or you might not have a pension. And so what that does is that turns your retirement investing accounts into a depreciating asset. So we gotta have a plan for sequence of return risk. So we look at this for them and we say, hey, this is the worst thing that could happen. The lost decade, the worst decade we've had in like 100 years. If this happens, you're out of money in 10 years. Right, we need to have a plan for that. We need to have a plan if this were to happen. Now let's look at, let's go to 1968. I've been using 1968 a lot because that really kind of mirrors where we're at today. We're in this slow recessionary environment with inflation that's up. And really it took from about 1968 to 1982 to kind of calm inflation. You know, Volcker had to put the pedal to the metal and raise interest rates and that really brought inflation down. Can we do that right now? I don't know. So let's look at what happened over that 14 year period and compare that to our portfolio. So if we look from 1968 on, now we're out of money at 69. So when we start putting some historical perspectives on this money, we run into some interesting situations. And so as an advisor, I might be looking at this and having a conversation like, hey guys, we've really gotta be delicate about this. Maybe you are retiring a little early. Maybe we don't need to spend $20,000 every year for 20, 30, 20 years for travel overseas. Maybe you do it every other year. Are there some things that we can adjust? And there are, and we're gonna go through that with them. But you need to be thinking about that for your financial plan, which is why you need a financial EKG. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, 
All the information is in the description below. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I hope this helped you. God bless. Bye-bye.